Is it international? Um, so, Dorothy, India is very huge as a country. I mean, I'm sure you would uh, understand. So, they are actually signing in from various parts of the country. And yes, there are few participants who have uh, registered even from outside India. Um, so, we had more than around 140 participants registered. 42 have already joined in. I'm hoping that we should touch close to 100 today. Okay, great. Yes. But I think with the recording, it's it's quite difficult for people to sometimes listen to a podcast in, in what's the middle of the day. So um, yes. the fact that you're doing so the recording, a recording all our recordings are usually available on our YouTube channel, as well as uh, we whoever had registered, they also get an email with our recording link. Perfect. Excellent. Good. Well, I'm looking forward to some engaged discussion. And I, hope we've got <laughs> yes. a, I hope we've got a lively group. Great. So a couple of more minutes. Dorothy, where are you signing in from? Which part of the I'm, world? I'm based in Brussels in Belgium. And we've yeah. actually got some sun here today. Oh, so fantastic. That's, <laughs> yeah, that, that is a recently that's been, hasn't happened very often because we're already starting to get into autumn and it's getting colder. So we've got a nice yes. bright sun day. In so fact, Delhi, which was very, very hot, has also become better because of rains. And I think in another month, we'll also be entering autumns. Delhi has some very extreme cold weather as well. So it's really? all hot all across. We have all kinds of weather. But uh, Brussels is beautiful. I visited Brussels a long time ago, uh, almost five, six years ago. It's a beautiful city. Yeah, I like it here very much. And um, it's, it's a, a hub, so a good place to travel and move around in very international cities. So I, I, I enjoy it enormously. So Please, I've never been, come I've never over been to, to India. India. We would love to host you. Come over to India. We would love to take I'd you. Love to, I'd love to come. It's on, it's on my bucket list, but I get so busy that I can... Um, well, let's talk I about how time. you can move your bucket list to make it happening list now. Soon. I will make it happen. Exactly. <laughs> good idea. Great idea. Great. Thank you so much, everyone, joining in. We are starting. Uh, hi, everyone. For some of the people who you have met in various programs and some of the people who have met me, my name is Sarika Bhattacharya. I am the founder and the CEO of Beyond Diversity Foundation. Um, as you, some of you all know, Beyond Diversity works in the space of building inclusive workplaces and communities. And we also create a lot of mentorship programs as well as learning discussions where we want to make sure that the leadership as well as the workforce is getting equipped with the new ideas, new business trends, as well as how they can manage the complexity and the diversity within the uh, communities these days. Today, uh, we have Dorothy Dalton, who is joining us. Welcome, Dorothy. Thank you so much for joining us. Hi. Good, good morning. Good afternoon. Yes. So Dorothy, in fact, uh, is a global talent management strategist. In fact, she has a very long list of accolades and accomplishments. So I will try to do some justice to it, Dorothy. Excuse me in case okay. I'm not. Okay. Keep it brief. <laughs> Keep it brief. Uh, she has been actually uh, working in the uh, diversity space and talent acquisition space to help create inclusive workplaces. She is the CEO of 3 Plus International, which supports organizations in achieving gender balance. Very akin to the work which we do, Dorothy, back here in Asia. Yeah. And, um, She's not only an inclusive recruitment specialist, but also a listed global influencer in the future of recruitment, a regular commentator and guest writer, speaker and trainer on workplace trends. She is an award-winning blogger and author of books, How Men and Women Apply for Jobs, How to Attract and Retain Female Talent, and Mentoring the Ultimate Guide. A lot of you have actually joined us from our mentoring programs. Dorothy, just to let you know, we run a very a large award-winning mentorship program known as LEAP which has actually worked with 500 plus women across India over the last few Fantastic. years. And Great. It has actually won recognition by uh, Hillary Clinton in US in 2015, this particular program. So we Fantastic. would love to hear your ideas around it. And Dorothy is going to share about us today, leading with emotional intelligence. All yours, Dorothy, the space is yours. I'm looking forward to a very interactive and learning uh, session. And uh, my team is also logged in and they're all willing to learn from you in the next one hour. Thank you so much for joining in. Thank you. Um, I'm, well, I'm delighted to be here to talk about what is a very hot topic. So leading with emotional intelligence. I mean, it should be one of these subjects that we can all 
um, cope with really easily, but it, for some reason, it's something that a lot of us or most of us struggle with. And that has some serious repercussions for our careers, our personal well-being, our organizations, and basically how we're blocking ourselves creating inclusive workplaces. Now, I attended a conference, a leadership conference here in Belgium on Friday, and one of the speakers asked the audience to Google the phrase, my boss is, okay? You can do this when you get offline. I don't want to lose you to your smartphones. Um, and when we did that, there were about 150, 200 people there. Not one person found a positive remark. So it was, my boss is an idiot, my boss is a micromanager, my boss is a bully, my boss is. They were all negative comments. And this ties in, oh, my boss was an idiot, by the way. I, I don't have a boss, but if I had one, it would be an idiot. Um, so I attended, um, so, uh, in this conference, um, they also talked about Gallup, the Gallup results on workforce, global workforce engagement, which is a report which has been out since 2017. And that tells us that 63% of employees are not engaged with their managers, or with their organizations. And one of the lines says at least 70, and I'm quoting this, at least 70% of variance in employee engagement scores is directly linked to, to the manager. So in plain English, okay, leaders make or break motivation within their teams. So I read um, when I was prepping for, the, for this webinar that in India engagement is at 22%. So if anyone wants to jump in and correct me, I'm happy to be corrected. In China, it's 13%, okay? So this means there are a lot of unhappy people in their jobs, right? So it means that the leaders are maybe not doing things as well as they could. And perhaps it's time to reevaluate the qualities we assign to our leaders and the qualities that we value. So if we're not leading with um, emotional intelligence, which is at the heart of employee engagement and inclusive workplaces. What does this mean? What are the downsides? Absenteeism, right? Um, impact on um, mental health and physical health is estimated by the World Health Authority to be $1 trillion, okay? Absenteeism from work in the EU is 6% of working time. In the US, it's 1% of payroll. So the implications for organizations are huge. We hear about poor interpersonal relationships. Me too. Increase in sex, sexism and harassment. 90% of women experience sexism and harassment in the workplace. Um, impact of incivility and bad behavior is on the increase. And research from Porath and Pearson say it's actually millions of incidents every day and has increased by 13%. But the other thing we will never know is we don't know what isn't raised. 75% of harassment, whether it's sexual harassment, moral harassment cases are not reported. And um, research from Deloitte tells us that employees, 75% of employees witness um, something that damages business success without intervening. So this passivity, we're colluding um, with creating un unhealthy workplaces, which are not good for any of us. And switching from leading with a more rational level of, or type of intelligence to a more emotionally um, intelligent leadership style is recognized by all research to be the way forward. So if anybody wants to pitch in, correct me, chip in, or has any comments, make sure that you put your comments into the chat. I'm going to be engaging you as we go along. I had a really nice introduction. Um, and one of the things that I do in my role is, is that I'm a practitioner as, as, as well as being a CEO. So I'm actively involved in working with leaders, trying to recruit or trying to recruit um, inclusively recruit and develop inclusive leaders um, and it's important that we try and focus on these skills and work on them so that we can make our workplaces better places for all of us. Now, I'm going to ask you a question. Which leaders do you think exhibit high levels of emotional intelligence? So 
just like that, just think of somebody that you think comes across as in the international environment as having a high level of emotional intelligence and put your answers in the chat box and someone will monitor it and we'll stop in in a couple of minutes and go back and and review that are, are you okay with that the three if we yes. do that <laughs> thank you so please do leave your messages on the chat box and uh, we will look at it people have already started putting it thank you so much okay excellent do you want me to wait for a bit to get some feedback or shall i carry on People have spoken about Oprah Winfrey, Michelle Obama, Barack Obama, Obama, Jackin, Jakinda, Tyra Banks, Modi. Mod, uh, Narendra Modi is a very big favorite these days. Uh, Ratan Tata, again, one of the very famous uh, business leaders out here. Modi, Modi, okay. Modi fans out here, um, and Obama fans too. Deepak Chopra. Uh, Deepak Chopra is mostly a writer. Um, a spiritual writer, yes, and uh, again, a Modi fan, Mukesh Ambani, Tim Cook. Yeah, yeah. Um, I was Obama, thinking, the first... I think the largest numbers are Obama, Ratan Tata, Modi. One person has written Richard Branson. Indra Noy, does anybody put that uh, put her in or Ursula Burns? I mean, I, I think, I think, I should have right, it as. Exhibiting high level of EI as a leader. Okay, that's that's a new one, right? Uh, Richard Branson, Justin Trudeau, Justin Trudeau is a good one. Tony Shea. So quite a few of them are there. Okay, so excellent. So I think we have in our heads how we imagine a leader who works with high level of emotional intelligence. So let's drill down a little bit into the detail now. So what we're going to talk about is, we're going to talk about what are the components of emotional intelligence. We're going to talk why emotional intelligence is important for personal and business success. And we're going to talk about the daily habits that you can take on to enhance your emotional intelligence. Okay, so let's crack on. Um, emotional intelligence is the ability to accurately identify your own emotions as well as the emotions of others. It's about being able to utilize those emotions and apply them to tasks such as strategic thinking, problem solving, and to foster better relationships to achieve better results. So this concept of emotional intelligence has been around since the early 90s when it was introduced um, in Yale University by psychologists John D. Mayer and Peter Salovey, but it has been developed by Daniel Goldman, who has become really the international expert on this. And he found a direct relationship between the emotional intelligence of a company's staff and the company's success. And we're going to dive into this a little bit in detail. That's just another um, definition, and it basically just sums up what I've um, already mentioned. So let's look on components of emotional intelligence. Daniel Goldman, the author and expert, says there are five. And one of the ways to think about this, have you ever um, done something yourself and thought, oh my gosh, why did I do that? What was I thinking? Or have you ever watched somebody behave in a certain way and you think, uh-uh, that's going to go wrong? So not using our emotional intelligence can sometimes be responsible for poor decisions, actions, and ultimately poor results and impact negatively our relationships. So individuals with high levels of EQ are able to communicate better, reduce their anxiety, diffuse conflicts, they're less stressed, they improve relationships, they empathize with others, and they seem to be able to overcome life's challenges in a way that others can't. So Col um, Goldman suggests that there are five components, self-awareness, self-regulation, motivation, empathy, and social skills. And we're going to talk about these in detail in a minute, but first we're going to talk about how they impact our success. So if anybody has got any comments, keep putting them in the chat box. So why are they important for career and business success? We all know people, don't we, who are just think they, they, it's effortless. They can walk into a room, they know everybody, everyone shakes their hand, they deal with difficult situations gracefully and graciously. 
they make others feel relaxed and at ease and people are very willing to help them, support them and go the extra distance to make sure that they succeed. And experts agree that this type of intelligence plays an important role in success. And some have suggested that emotional intelligence is more important than IQ or academic achievement. So let's have a look about how it impacts our personal and career success. It helps us build better relationships. People who have emotional intelligence, they take ownership for their, for their emotions, their work, um, everything they do. They hold themselves to account and they are willing to be held to account. Diffuse conflict. They never get into these em emotional um, spats, whether it's online or by email or in person. They're able to find win-win solutions. They're difficult to offend, they can neutralize criticism and take constructive feedback. They can even take unconstructive feedback. They're positive thinkers. They forgive, they don't dwell in the past. So it happened, I've learned from it, let's move on. Get things done. People come to them because they achieve things. And finally, um, Goldman says they have a sense of humor and they're fun, so they're fun to be around. They make being in a relationship with, with them, whether it's a personal relationship or professional relationship, it's fun and rewarding. And don't forget that a lot of these things are my personal opinion, so if you think I've left anything out. Um, don't hesitate to put it in the chat box. I'm always open to learning um, other people's ideas. So let's ask you another question. Anyone on this call finds emotional intelligence a channel, a challenge? Do you find it difficult to carry out any of those behaviors? Put your answers in the chat box and we'll just have a, a listen. Yes, yes or no is fine for the time being. Who finds emotional intelligence a challenge? Hey guys, looking forward to your uh, answers to this. Uh, we get yes, no, no, don't find it as a challenge. Sometimes managing anger, especially in the time press situations. I personally believe, Dorothy, it's very difficult to maintain that uh, a very you know, ambivalent or equivalent stage throughout. There will be sometimes very stressful and sometimes very difficult situations where um, you, your, even your anger or your stress takes over the best of you. And then that's something with, I find it as a very big challenge during those times. Yeah. And, and, and I think it, I think it depends if, um, if you're a reactor type of person, which I am sadly, or, or a treater and that neither are ideal. And, and I think we all have to work on very much a reactive kind of a person, but over the years I have decided to observe silence in stressful situation, move out and then move back again after five, 10, 15 minutes or even a day and not yeah. react to any emails immediately. So many times I've typed it out, deleted it and then let it sit in, that, in my outbox but not sent it. So some of yeah, those have actually saved my day. But yeah, yes, the 20, 24 hour rules are a good strategy. Yeah. So let's let's talk uh, talk about. So I think we've got a mix of responses, if I've understood correctly. Yes, so let's talk a, about now. Challenge. A lot of people have said um, not as such, but sometimes people do say it's difficult to be considerate all the time. So I think everybody is speaking about how to manage difficult situations, difficult conversations, difficult relationships, and we all have those in our lives. Without them, like, it won't be fun either. I uh, I agree exactly. Now we're going to talk about why emotional intelligence is better for business and we're going to link it to employee engagement and creating and working in an inclusive culture and for the leaders on the team this is really important okay so let's talk about the business results that teams that have a higher level of emotional intelligence they're more effective communicate better generate a higher sense of belonging and psychological security. I don't know if any of you are familiar with the research from Google which on effective teams which talks about the Aristotle, Aristotle project and, and this actually um, 
they found that psych psychological security is the top requirement for people. They want to feel safe coming to work. They want to feel secure that they can voice their opinions without fear of reprisal. So there's actually, we're now getting hard data that this sense of belonging and psychological security is increasingly important. And there's also um, work from the Deloitte Institute of, of um, Inclusion that talks about people who have to adapt to a dominant culture and, and it's called covering and women have to do this a lot. Um, that if you have to adapt to a, a dominant culture, then that also has a negative effect. So it's really important to treat your people with emotional intelligence, more innovative, they have a higher retention rate and research suggests that 80 percent of, of employees say that inclusion is an important factor in choosing an employer so it's important for your employer brand and 72 percent consider leaving an organization for one that is more inclusive so it, it it's actually becoming not so much an hr issue or or even an individual management issue it's a business issue so really important that we pay attention to that so now we're going to talk about the individual components that i mentioned and and discuss them in just a little bit more detail self-awareness okay Self-awareness is the ability to recognize and understand our own emotions and is a critical part of emotional intelligence. It's not just about recognizing our own emotions, but the emotions of other people. It's about being able to read the room, read the meeting, understand what is going on and reacting accordingly. To become emotionally self-aware, we need to be able to monitor our own emotions, recognize our different reactions, and correctly identify each particular emotion. Now, a lot of people can't do that. Um, are we angry? Are we sad? Are we frustrated? Are we defensive? Put a name, really work hard on it. I'm going to tell you how to do that later. Many people don't understand the difference. And one, I think, it, it, a cultural um, issue is that many emotions, negative emotions, manifest themselves in terms of anger, which is not good for the workplace. So when we're self-aware, we can recognize the connection between how we feel and how we behave in theory anyway. We can say, why was I short-tempered with Bob, for example? Was it because he challenged my opinion? Did I feel threatened? Did I feel he was belittling me? Did I feel less than? So there are all sorts of questions we can ask ourselves to really drill down to the detail and find out what was going on and how we reacted in a certain way. Um, when we are self-aware we recognize our own strengths and limitations and this makes us open to new information and experience because we're willing to learn okay we don't feel defensive we open up and it means that we're able to delegate more effectively all of these lovely things come from being more self-aware and Goldman suggests, as I said earlier, that people who have self-awareness have tend to have a good sense of humor, they're self-confident, they're aware of how people perceive them, and they're confident about their abilities, and they're also confident about the things they can't do. And that's something that is really hard for most of us to get a handle on, that we feel secure in knowing what we can't do. So if anybody's got any um, comments on self-awareness ship in and um, we can we can come back to them and I can look at them later let's move on to self-regulation and consistency and this is something that we just talked about some couple of you put it in your chat box um, being consistent is really difficult emotional regulation is about our ability to con con control strong emotions by not acting on our immediate feelings in, a, in an impulsive or potentially destructive manner. So developing the ability to step back and reflect, particularly on our negative reactions and feelings, gives us the time and space to decide how we want to respond. And this allows us to act consistently. Now, have you ever had a boss where you just don't know how they're gonna 
they're going to be ha how they're going to behave what their mood is like you choose your moments for when you give them some information sometimes they're they're great sometimes they're not and um, sometimes they're angry sometimes they, they're silent it's very difficult to be around someone who is not consistent that you don't feel comfortable in approaching on an everyday basis so it's very very important to be mindful of this in your own behavior so emotional regulation helps us to listen better and rather than either sounding off or retreating which we talked about reacting or retreating and it allows us to make better decisions from a place of reflection does that make sense everyone anybody got any comments that you want to put in the chat box please fire ahead anybody Let's now move on to motivation. This is a great slide because it starts with you, right? Um, people think that it's up to you to motivate, um, to be motivated by a good leader, but at some point, intrinsic motivation starts with you. And it plays a key role in emotional intelligence. People who are emotionally intelligent are motivated by things that go beyond popularity, recognition, financial reward. They have a passion to fill their own goals and they have a vision. And those that are competent in this area tend to be action orientated. They, they have a need for achievement. It's not about not being ambitious, but they're looking for ways to achieve that, which is not at the expense of their own personal um, psychological and physical well-being, or at the expense of others. So these are the people who can achieve their goals and bring people with them. That's really, really important. They find balance. They also tend to be committed and are good at taking the initiative. Um, people rely on them, they get things done, and they can quite often think out of the box and come with different ideas. So they're quite often more creative. Does that make sense, everybody? Got any? Keep putting comments in the in, in the message box if you want so, to. Dorothy, there are a couple of questions which have come up. I don't know. Would, oh, you, yeah. want to, would you want to take them now or would you want to yeah, take let's, them? Yeah, let's. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, we have uh, Pankaj writing in saying, can we also uh, brief how to notice or know what are some of the low signs of emotional intelligence and how can an individual identify his or her level of emotional intelligence? I mean, are, are there any are there any online tests or yeah, something like that? Yes, or maybe certain circumstances or situations to look out for, uh, which kind of shows that uh, the person has a low emotional intelligence and needs to rectify. I, I have personally found that more than the online test, um, I have actually started looking at which are the situations where I am not at my best self as emotionally intelligent. And I started recording it over the years and I've started some of my close friends and colleagues uh, asking them to point it out to me, which also helped me as a feedback. I think a kind of a 360 feedback at times helps you to understand where you could possibly go wrong and which are the ways you can possibly mitigate that. I don't know if that makes sense, Dorothy, all yours. Well, I think what we're going to do is to, um, to just put this into the daily. Um, I've got a section on daily habits for mm -hmm. each components so it might be better actually to, to wait for the very specific questions and we can go to them on the daily practices you can do to make that is is one that okay yeah one last question also so yeah. maybe you would want to cover it now or later on i leave the choice to you uh one people uh, one person um annie has mentioned how can we make people realize that they are being inconsistent um and also one more person has mentioned uh, that how do we deal with inconsistent people? So similar kind of a question. Uh, so incons inconsistency is one big issue which people are dealing with. And yeah, I it. think it's a massive issue. Let, let's park those questions and we'll, we'll deal with it in the daily habits. And it's, it's about, and I'm going to talk about constructive communication. How can you convey um, that someone is, um, a, is behaving in a certain way that you find difficult to deal with? And, and we'll, we'll cover that in a bit more detail. So um, let's move on to empathy. Um, I think everybody understands what empathy is. Um, it's critical to emotional intelligence. And it's, it's more than being able to identify the emotional states of, of others. It involves 
um, being able to respond in a way based on the information you receive, but it's not to be um, confused with sympathy, and quite a lot of people do that. So, um, for example, if you if you sent sense that someone is feeling sad or hopeless it's going to impact how you respond you might be more sensitive you might show more support you might make an effort to cheer them up you're not going to um, get depressed with them okay and a good example of this is if someone has to um, deliver negative news maybe a firing or or a poor review um, you feel badly that you've got to do this you empathize with the person um, but empathy is encouraging them to find a new job, to show them ways they can improve, um, to give them helpful suggestions. Sympathy is feeling so badly for them that you don't actually deliver that. Okay, so it's about recognizing your boundaries, understanding um, how you ways in which you can deliver news of any kind, understand someone's position, but you don't necessarily have to agree with them. And that, that can be very difficult to, to find um, the fine line between that. So those with high levels of empathy um, understand quite often these subtle signals in workplaces, they understand the office politics, they know what's going on behind the scenes, and this helps them to navigate ambiguity and uncertainty. And in today's um, agile workforces where everybody people are based remotely all of these things where communication is is more remote it's quite difficult to um to get a, a hold on that so and i'm going to give you some examples of how to become more empathetic let's talk now about sort of social skills sorry i've gone too fast um being able to interact well with others is, is obviously an important social skill. We talk about the people who are able to work the room, people uh, 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 and are attracted to them, that they, 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 they're like a light and, and people, like, they're like moths around a lamp bulb. But this is critical in a workplace. It's about building relationships, rapport, um, and they, they tend to be really good communicators. They have active listening skills, good verbal communication skills. They have good non-verbal communication skills. I mean, one of the things that we don't understand is we're actually sending a lot of signals. Um, about how we really feel. And a, a good for instance in this is, I recently um, have, was facially profiled, which is um, that people can basically anticipate your reaction, uh, how your eyes are. And even though I've reined in my reactive side, it still shows in you know the way my eyes look. You can't see I've got glasses on now, but you know, I might just look astounded and that clearly conveys um, a message so important to pay attention to your non-verbal communication body language um, and this is vital to all leadership um, it's combined with persuasiveness and negotiation skills all of these wonderful soft skills that are so hard to acquire so in today's business environments and as i said where people are um, spread remotely and um, a lot of us are communicating online via um, slack or chat box or intranets all of these things even there's even a new language with emojis we can convey the wrong message in in a nanosecond and just to give you a for instance um, a friend of mine broke his leg and instead of sending um a sort of sad face crying emoji i sent laughing out loud emoji which clearly was not um impressed at all so very careful particularly with your online communication research suggests that 30 percent of online communications are negatively received so who thinks um, emotional intelligence is an innate quality so put your answers in the chat box do you think this is something that you're born with let's see what you think Please do put in your answers in the chat box. Do you think it's an innate quality, a quality which you're born with and you cannot possibly, or it's a skill? Shritish writes, it's a skill. Somebody says that it, it is innate, but can be developed too. It can be learned. Most of the people say, yes, it can be learned and also grows by experience. 
Okay, excellent. Well, I absolutely agree with you. So, um, it definitely is a learned skill and something that we can develop and we can build on. I think there are people who are very fortunate um, who have a lot of these skills, they are born with them. And sometimes if they're a bit cavalier with them, they can be, also become a trap if people take them for granted. And my experience is that the people who um, appreciate them have had to put some effort in are usually the people who are much more diligent and careful and mindful with the way they handle things. So it's a skill, we're all agreed on that. So Aristotle said, we are what we repeatedly do. Excellence then is not an act, but a habit. So I've put together some habits and we can discuss in detail. If it answers some of the questions that you put in the chat box, then um, we can, hopefully they will, you know, make some sense to you. If you want me to elaborate on anything, then just let me know. So let's go back to the first one, which was build your self-awareness, okay? The most important thing is to set aside time for a period of reflection and women in particular who are other centered tend not to do this and um, we we're just so busy we we you know we've got busy jobs we've got busy households we might i mean particularly now with um internet and smart devices we are, are available to friends family workplaces um 24 7 three, six, five, so what I would suggest you do is you set aside a period of time with intent specifically to focus on yourself. So commit it, block it off in your calendar, tell your family, okay? Tell your family you don't want to be disturbed. And if you do it when you're in the shower, in the bath, in the park, having a walk, sitting on the bus, it doesn't matter. But just say, I am going to do this and I intend to do this now. Okay, and 3 Plus has some worksheets, which if you struggle with that, which I put a link at the end, which you can download, but they're completely free. It's just about guided reflection. Have a vision and goals. Really important, really important for also for the, for the women on the call. Um, research from 3 Plus says that many women don't set goals. Um, so it's really important to close your eyes and have a vision for yourself. Also factor in what's important to you. What are your values? Okay. It's important to know what you stand for. And if you know what you stand for, you know what you stand against. And that allows you to set boundaries. And we're going to talk about boundary setting um, later. So all of these things are important. Understand your strength and how you thrive okay congratulate congratulate yourself if you do something well know what you're good at start to self-monitor understand where you excel and what conditions brought that about understand what you need to work on and notice i haven't put weakness know your weaknesses um, we're living in an age where continuous learning growth mindset is vital right so it's important now to um just think okay i need to work on presentations i need to do this whatever it is that you feel you need to work on do not beat yourself up because you can't do something perfectly practice self-observation as i said see where you thrive see what makes you a little bit nervous and then write it down if you write it down it becomes real okay and then you can go back to it and sometimes um if you write it down immediately or as near to the time that it happened um we have to sometimes have a false memory of what we do you know sometimes you think oh i really blew that up you know i made a mess of that and actually maybe you didn't um so important to to do that and make a note pay attention to your reactions okay and we're going to talk about this more and more okay just become aware of your emotions, your mind, your body, and see how you are reacting to a certain set of situations. See if there's a pattern. And when you recognize the pattern, make a note of it, and then you can go back and work on it. And then understand your trigger points. So going back to Bob, 
you know, did Bob make you defensive? Why did Bob make you defensive? Understand that maybe perhaps you need to be more open to receiving feedback, or maybe it's a certain type of um, bias that you might have. And this brings me on to my last one. This is something that all of us, we all have inherent biases and we do not um, do enough work on this. This is everybody everywhere, no matter where you are in the world. Um, there's the Harvard Im Implicit Bias Test, which I strongly recommend that you all do if you haven't done it. Um, and just to see where, where you stand, and just to give you a for instance, I did the Harvard Implicit Bias Test on gender, and even someone like me comes, has mild gender bias. Okay, so it can be a bit of a, um, a, a wake up call. So just do as much as you can to, to try and um, look into yourself and find out how you are. And then we'll come, up, we'll come up to how other people might see you. So does that make sense? Does anybody have any comments or anything they want to um, put in to, to that little piece there? Anybody? I think people are listening to you, Dorothy, so we can possibly take the questions and the comments in the end. Okay, uh, fine. Okay. So if, anyway, if you've got anything specific, um, put it in the chat box. We'll get to it at the end. Self-regulation. Now, this is something I've struggled with um, over the years, and it's taken a lot of coaching um, to get myself where I can get into business neutral and uh, to be mindful and a place of reflection. But the first thing is you have to take responsibility for your feelings and behavior. I don't know if anybody who's got any kids and your kids said, you made me do that, okay? No one can make you do anything. You are the only person who can be responsible for your feelings and behavior. And it's not your organization's fault, you have options. You, they might, may not be great options, um, but you still have options and it's your responsibility to explore the, um, those options and maybe make informed decisions. Manage your stresses. We talked about um, self-awareness. So you're starting to develop a patterns of observation. You know that you get really upset when someone challenges your opinion at a meeting or it's just that people like Bob really tick you off. Um, but you have to look at what your stresses are and you have to learn to manage them. Do you need to breathe? Do you need to not send that email? Do you need to step out of the room? There will be lots of things you can do to give yourself breathing space to reflect. The other important thing is to anticipate how you're going to feel and how you will react. So you might know that when you meet Bob, um, or you go into a meeting and someone challenges um, your opinion, that you sometimes feel defensive. So prepare yourself for that. Prepare yourself to breathe, um, to take time. Tell someone, give me a minute, I need to think about that. There is nothing wrong with asking for time. Also, saying nothing is a valid option. You can even say something, I need to reflect on that. Um, I'll come back to you in a minute. Okay, and honestly, trust me, someone who's learned the hard way, um, it's really worth doing. So this allows you to respond, not to react to differences, and it produ produces much better results. So you reflect um, and you give, give a considered and measured response, not a reaction. Any reaction, um, on either side of the spectrum, whether or not it's to go for it or to just retreat, neither are good. You've got to find that halfway space. People who have realistic goals and have a plan are much better able to self-regulate because once you have a plan, you will know that if something is in line with your goals and what you need to do to meet your goals. So if you need to develop better relationships, um, then you have to have a plan to do that. So incorporate whatever it is you're dealing with into your goals, your strategy, and your plan. What is self-care, emotional and physical well-being? And I to toyed with this. I wasn't even sure whether to put this first. 
Um, once again, we're also busy. Very often we don't get enough sleep. Um, we might eat at our desks. Um, we don't exercise. We're stuck in traffic jams. We don't, we don't nurture our core relationships. So one of the most important things to self-regulation and to feeling good about yourself and being in charge of yourself is to practice self-care. And I'd be interested, um, you can put your answer, some answers to this in the chat box. How many people mindfully practice self-care with, with a view to their emotional and physical well-being? I, I would say that most people feel under pressure or overwhelmed quite a lot of the time. And um, research says that, that we have something now called the overwhelmed employee, where we're all, we're all doing too much. One of the ways to deal with this is to maintain schedule, okay? If you can, it's not always possible, but I would really advise you to, to keep um, a schedule and a routine. Um, once again, this comes to having realistic goals and having a plan. And last one, which is once again, also one of the most important thing is detox from devices. It's an addiction. We're, we're a globe of addicts. And research from KPMG says we check our phones 150 times a day, right? I think more than that, Dorothy. Okay, well, I, I'm, I, I'm going to be cautious on this. 150 times a day. I've worked out that just say by the time you've swiped, you've put, logged in, you've checked your mail, Facebook, Twitter, whatever, um, say that's a minute. That's 150 minutes. That is two and a half hours, right? That is in a working a working week, that is 12 nights, one and a half days, okay, on our phone. We are mad. So um, I've given you these things um, just as I felt they might be interesting. I think in some cases, some of you might need to do um, a few things first. Maybe if the device thing is a barrier, then maybe that's the thing you need to um, give priority to. So these are just like, a salad of bits that you can pull out and choose your own priorities um, and and take it from there. Empathy. Okay. People think particularly that empathy is is an innate skill. And and I think of the components, this is something possibly that might be, but it's also something that we can learn. Become an active listener. How do you become an active listener? Well, first of all, you are present, so get rid of your devices. I mean, how many of us are listening to someone with a phone in our hands? So you're present, you're engaged, your body language, you're making eye contact, you're listening to them. You don't make assumptions, okay? Quite often, quite often when we're presented with a problem, we um, make an assumption, and because we tend to listen, waiting to speak, rather listening to hear, we easily fall into the assumption trap. So how do you avoid all of this? Ask questions. What makes you say that? Can you clarify? What's going on for you? All of these are really short questions, open-ended questions that get that other person to open up. Going to Sarita's um, point about asking for feedback, ask people, okay, how do you think that went? What can I do better? Or I even don't, I won't say I don't like what can I do better, what could I have done differently? But better suggest there's a judgment, what could I have done differently? That's really important to when you're trying to get feedback. Um, and that way that you, you don't get, make someone feel uncomfortable um, thinking they're giving you negative feedback. When you do get this feedback, don't personalize the criticism and that's something that we all do. Uh, you know, we, we, we look as standard and really you thought that. Um, don't personalize the criticism, okay? Take it, I hear what you say, okay? Um, can you elaborate on, can you clarify, help me understand what you meant by that? Okay, what do you think I can do to work on that? Look for concrete and tangible action points. 
Does that make sense, everybody? And then finally, recognize and reward. And that's something, one of the key um, connectors between burnout in men and women um, in organizations is lack of recognition. And that's something that happens in non-inclusive workplaces and in teams that are not led with emotional intelligence, okay? We don't recognize and reward. We don't recognize and reward the people on the team. Great job, thank you. I worked with one group in Greece where people didn't even say hello and good morning. I mean, it just seems astonishing. Um, but it's important even just to recognize that that person is there. Make sure that if your team is remote, that you're contacting them. You know, set alerts so that you're reminded, I've got to be in touch with that person. And the other thing is to recognize and reward yourselves. If, if, we, if you have a tendency to perfection, you are going to be hard on yourself. If you're hard on yourself, you are likely to be hard on others. So recognize your own achievements. Reward yourself. You know, have a nice lunch. Um, make sure you do something you really like doing, whether it's a walk in the park or, you know, going for a run or spending time with your family, whatever it is. But recognize and reward others and recognize and reward yourself. Because how you treat yourself will be reflect, reflected on how you treat others. Make sense, everybody? This is very helpful, very, very helpful, Dorothy. Okay, let's have a look at some social skills. And we talked about, you know, the person who walks into the room, they know everybody, everybody knows them, they're like little Mr. and um, Mrs. Popular. Um, and sometimes that can make us feel, you know, a little bit less than or inadequate. But social skills are um, things that we can develop even for introverts, okay? Um, we can be approachable and open, okay? And one of the things about inclusive workplaces that leaders expect their reports to be approachable and open, but they're not reproachable and open themselves. So they quite often say, I didn't know so-and-so, why is so-and-so leaving? I didn't know she felt like that. Um, and it's probably because you did not create an environment where that person felt comfortable communicating with you. So be approachable and open and create an inclusive environment around yourself. Be positive, okay? Be positive in your body language. If you're sculling around the, the, the corridors with a scowl on your face and your shoulders are drooped and you're looking miserable, you know, nobody is going to come up to you and, uh, and approach you unless they think that you know something is wrong they might think you're sick and they'll say you know what's the matter but if you want to um be seen in a positive way then you have to present a positive attitude devices again and i'm, I'm repeating this because it, it, it's a massive problem and um I, i've been in networking events where people are on their phones um i've, I've seen people sitting on a sofa texting each other they're sitting next to each other and they're texting each other someone might send an email to a person sitting two meters away get up go around knock on their pod whatever it is and speak to them and we've even reached a point in our culture where when people get voice calls, they're, they're not called telephone calls anymore, they're called voice calls, they, they consider that to be an intrusion. So somehow or other, we have to find a balance between you know, the disruption, but also um, you know, maintaining interpersonal relationships. So please talk to people. I mean, it's, that's something that we can all do. So network and build alliances. This is something that, that women tend to be weaker at than men. Um, I'm gender stereotyping a bit, but I, um, I, I'm going to do that. Women quite often have great personal networks, but they don't leverage it, those networks for business advantage. Um, they sometimes lack key alliances um, at a senior level. So really important as part of your plan is to network, build alliances, get that support. And this is very important if you have a problem, then you've got that um, network in place. There's a great line saying, don't fix your roof when it's raining. Quite often people turn to their networks when they have a problem. Um, and that really ticks people off. So 
make networking and alliance building as part of your overall strategy. Open yourselves to new experiences. Don't stay in your comfort zone. Um, and I'll also add to that your confirmation bubble. We all like to be around people who think and are like us. So open yourself up to differences, new experiences, meet people you, you don't usually meet. I mean, I, I work with people who, um, particularly in big organizations, they might have a big building. They do not know the people on the floor below them. Okay. So, you know, make a point of introduce, it's a little bit of the networking, but it's open yourself to new experiences, put yourself forward for a new project or um, something that's new and that is going to develop your experiences. Now, this is the point we come to practice constructive communication. And um, can you just read the question back to me about, um, you know, what to do if? I think you might, yeah. One of the questions which came in the initially was how to actually work on the inconsist inconsistencies. And I think, uh, Dorothy, with your daily practice habits, a lot of these kind of questions are being answered. Uh, so inconsistency was one question which uh, happened. The second question which has come in recently is um, ask, sometimes asking for feedback. You have asked, you've mentioned over here that seek feedback. Uh, but uh, sometimes asking for feedback is considered as being weak, wanting for approval. This is a question, I don't know who has written because it's coming from an iPhone. Uh, the name is not there. What is your perception, Dorothy, on this? Is asking feedback uh, really weak? I, I, I don't see so, but I would like to hear your... Uh, um, I, 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 I don't think so. And it, I think it depends on the language that you use. Exactly. Um, and in fact, the last point is, is the power of language. So if you say, um, you know, how, how do, what was your reaction to that? How do you feel about that? Was there anything I could have done differently? So if you use differently compared to better, that, um, that opens up a dialogue. And the most important thing when you are um, wanting feedback is to keep the dialogue open. Very often people, if you say, what could I have done better? Um, you're almost saying, okay, well, they're going to give you some negative criticism or they're going to um, say, no, you did great. But if you say, what could I have done differently? They might say, have you thought of? Or um, would you consider, I mean, hopefully, um, if they're constructive communicators. So, and all of this, and there was another question when it came to, I think it was on, on, on the, feedback again if you, if you can just read that out to me um somebody asked about was so it negative more, so one more person spoke so you spoke about uh, i mean is that uh, looking for feedback weak which you answered it's not it no it's not yes. but use yeah use uh, what could i've done differently yeah and there was there's one other question. there's another question from Gita, which is kind of um, you can take it from here is that when uh, on criticism uh, we speak about not taking it personal, but sometimes what happens is the person who is giving the feedback possibly is repeating similar kind of a language or missing that language where it does become personal. Uh, how do you tackle that situation? Okay, the, the, there's a great strategy um, and, and you can use this in any situation where you're, you're handling a difficult situation. It's pointed, um, point it out, check it out, work it out. So the point it out is always about you. You don't say, you know, you said this, you did that. It's um, when I hear that type of feedback, um, so you're hearing it, what was your experience? I experienced, I felt, I felt uncertain, I wasn't sure. Um, and then can you go into greater detail? Can you clarify? Um, in fact, there are three words which I think are the most useful in the whole English language are help me understand. And honestly, you can apply, you can apply those to almost any situation. Help me understand what made you say that. Help me understand your thinking behind that comment. So it's about applying the skill, um, the strategies of attentive listening um, to any incoming data. So someone gives you negative, that, that was a terrible presentation. Okay, well, clearly that person is not 
at least to communicating constructively. Help me understand what made you say that. Sure. And they'll say, well, this, that, and the other. Can you clarify? And, and it's also, I mean, you can use that when you see instances of sexism, bullying, harassment, negative feedback, it's, it's, it's a gold mine. Help me understand. So um, practice the next time you, that comes along and, and let me know if it works or not. I, I find it very useful. So it's, it's about just opening it up, diffusing the situation, making it into a dialogue. That's what I mean, the power of language. So your vocabulary selection is really in, in important. So if someone says, that was a terrible presentation. Really? <laughs> you know, really? Well, I think that's a cheek. Um, so that's your reaction. And you can say, oh, okay, well, I hear you. And um, help me understand what made you think that. And ask for precise details, okay? Which elements um, did you think were terrible? Um, you know, and, and really push to dr drill down into the detail. And you find that when people make these sweeping generalizations, they will usually dial back. That's my experience anyway. So I hope that um, was helpful. It clarifies quite a bit. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so let's move on to motivation. And once again, it's the positive thinking. You've got to look positive. You've got to commit to a growth mindset. You've always got to be learning in today's environment because if you get left behind, um, it's very hard to, to stay up to date and, and people will discount you. Get comfortable with discomfort, okay? And, and I like this because if somebody asks you to do something, don't think that's not my job or um, I'm not good enough or I'm not, I'm not skilled enough. Women, when you're applying for, for jobs, um, you self-deselect with 60% of the job criteria. Doesn't matter. Go for it. You know, you might not feel totally comfortable, but go ahead and apply. Another important thing is to be willing to ask for help. And that makes us a little bit vulnerable, but it also shows that we're motivated to learn. You know, just asking people. Most people are really delighted to help. And once again, it's about navigating adversity. We all have setbacks. So instead of seeing this as failure or a disaster, just think of it as the learning experience and how you can incorporate that and move on. It is not the end of the world, okay? Life as you know it usually won't stop. It's what can I do to um, grow from this? What can I learn from it? How can I stop it happening again? And what are my next steps? So it goes, loops right back to the self-awareness and the self-regulation. And you can see that all of these are completely intertwined. Um, now I'm going to talk about how we self-sabotage. Let me count the ways. These are just a few. We speak before listening. We interrupt. Okay? Um, and quite often, we, because we've interrupted, we speak before listening, we don't know the story. We're going back to the making of some assumptions. We complain, okay? We complain about the organization, our boss, our colleagues, you know, the cafeteria, the coffee, it doesn't matter. We're complaining about everything. Once you get into that mindset, it's very difficult. So stop complaining. Think of solutions. So people um, who work with emotional intelligence are very solution focused. They find a way of dealing with something. That's the negativity, okay? Find a, a best way forward. Drama and gossiping. Um, certainly when I've worked in, in big organizations, you know, the drama and gossip which is just part of everyday life, right? Um, try and stay out of it. Um, if, you, um, if you hear people gossiping, distance yourself. I know that's sometimes not easy, but you just say, I don't feel comfortable with this so um, I, I'm going to leave I, either I'm leaving the group or I would prefer you stop particularly if it's about an individual okay because that is a form of it can turn into mobbing if people are ganged up again against by a group so distance yourself well, in the past, the fact that, you know, someone did something in, you know, 2005, you know, it's neither here nor there, it is not going to help you dwelling on that. Um, there are things that we can learn from previous 
mistakes or instances, we build from it, just think about it, build on it, let it go. People who work with emotional intelligence and lead with emotional intelligence, they do not dwell in the past. They are future focused. The other thing is submitting to peer pressure. And this, this can be really um, powerful, particularly in cultures which have um, particular domination of one group. So, and uh, one of the one of the areas that I'm thinking of is particularly men who don't take um, family leave or people who um, fall into a group groupthink. Okay, and this is really really important that you don't subscribe to that. And but standing apart from that is also it's a little bit like distancing yourself from drama and gossiping. That might be the culture of the thing that everybody is doing and the way we do things here. But I'm not comfortable with that. And then you have to review your options, whether that organization is the right one for you. Don't be judgmental. Um, it's very often easy to hear things or see things and immediately make a judgment. Be open to finding out what's going on for people because none of us know what other people are going through. So, you know, we, we'll back to our, our guide, Bob, you know, maybe you know, something had happened that made him adopt a tone, we don't know. So, you know, find out what's going for for, for Bob if you took his um, criticism, you know, was it his tone, was it me, was it him, what's going on? Ask him, ask Bob, maybe something bad has happened. Don't exclude, and this is something, it's, it's you know, like um, obviously working in inclusive organizations when people are different to us we quite often are not as welcoming as we should be so I ask everybody to make an effort to be inclusive whether it's someone of a different gender a different age um, a, a, you know comes from a different region um, doesn't matter please try and be inclusive and don't exclude certainly you don't make accusations that's normal. That goes back to um, the listening skills, not making assumptions, don't make it, um, accusations. You know, for example, someone's late with a project, you don't say, you're always late. Okay, I've noticed um, that you've been late a few times on this project. Help me understand what's going on for you. It might be that someone has a sick mother or, or I mean, some dreadful thing has happened. But it, make a point of drilling down to get the detail with attentive listening and quite an open-ended questioning to find out what's at the root of it. So Dorothy, uh, we are just a quick uh, check. Um, we are kind of almost at the closure period of time. Because... Okay, I've got one more point and I'm done. Sure, great. And then we can maybe take a quick Q&A before we wrap okay. up. Right. And the last one is to stand, uh, um, don't be a bystander. So make sure that you um, Intervene if you see anything that is going on that makes you feel uncomfortable and make sure that you intervene once again to find out and do your best to make sure that it goes on a correct path. So that's me done. I'm finished. Okay, then you. here's the make it happen. I, I won't talk about this slide, but it's the coach or a mentor, join a group, read blogs, talk to your colleagues, and seek different peers. The fact Any that the fact that everyone is part of this group, seeking a mentor, finding people, finding peers is a very good start out here. Thank you so much, Dorothy, for that. In fact, I learned quite a bit and a lot of, in, a lot of things added on my to-do list on an everyday habits. Thank you so much. That was so precise in terms of each and every uh, aspect of it, which has uh, given me a lot of food for thought. Um, we will take a quick Q&A. If you have any questions right now for the la next five minutes, uh, then we can quickly, uh, you know, take it up. Uh, yes, there will be a slide deck available. In the sense, there will be not a slide deck. This particular video would be available on YouTube channel. You can use that video for your uh, slides, but we will not be sharing any slide deck. Um, and uh, somebody wrote about this, not being a bystander. Pyle wrote about this, not being a bystander and speaking up isn't always taken in a positive manner and may backfire as well. What's your take on that? I think it depends how it's done. 
and and I think that there are two things. If you if you see um, something happening, I, it obviously depends on the incident. I mean, some incidents can be quite serious, and you might even have to call the police. But if it's just a minor incident, um, it goes back to the constructive communication. You can either do it at the time or later. I noticed um, I noticed that um, this happened, um, or you did this, and I, I don't feel comfortable with that. And I'd like to feel confident that going forward, it's not going to happen again. If it happens to a person, if someone, for example, a sexist comment, rather than making the target twice a victim, so you don't say, don't pick on Susie, rather make it about, when you make sexist comments to Susie, I don't feel comfortable. I would like you to stop doing that. You know, Dorothy, one of the biggest learning which I learned from your session today is that whether it's seeking feedback, whether giving any kind of a feedback, whether you are speaking up, it all depends upon the power of language, how you position it, how you say it, and how you ultimately make the other person feel when you're saying it. I think that's and the crucial part of the whole uh, piece around it. Um, and that comes back to self-regulation and empathy. Exactly. Um, and yeah, so they're all really, really interconnected and overlapping. So I've broken them down into com components, but actually you could just mix them all up and a lot of the elements would apply to the other. So, I mean, there's a lot of content here that people can, can work with. Somebody wrote about uh, avoiding peer pressure is very difficult. How do you consciously avoid it? Uh, what's your take on that, Dorothy? Um, I think it's, um, it, once again, it depends. You physically distance yourself. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you move yourself into another place or you can shut off, you can put a barrier, you can just close yourself off um, or you can say, I am not comfortable with this. And that might be the way you think, um, but I prefer to, um, you know, swim in my, there's a great line, swim in my own lane. You know, it's where you block out the white noise. You know, this is what you want to do. Um, it's not what I want to do. And it depends on the severity of the incidents. You, you, I've known actually people who are working in, a, in a, an organization where the dominant culture is, is quite unhealthy and they've had to make a decision if they stay in the organization or not. So, you know, that might be one of the things you want to consider. Can you act on it? Can you, um, you know, raise it with your manager? I don't feel comfortable when this happens. How can we deal about it? You know, how can we deal with it? Um, and then you have to review your options, moving out of the department, um, maybe even moving out of the organization. I think once again, self-awareness, it's about your values, laying your boundaries down. Well, thank you so, so much, Dorothy. That was, that was very, very insightful. I think, I mean, everybody has been writing out here. Thank you for a great session. It was very insightful, but it was fantastic to have you there. And um, as I said, it was a personally very enlightening ex uh, session for me because there's so much one can keep doing to keep improving yourself and keep learning. Um, it was a great uh, learning uh, journey for me as well. Thank you so much, Dorothy. We, it was a pleasure to host you and we look forward to many more interactions with you on this. Okay, it was my pleasure to be here and here's my thank you. Oh, thank you. Great. And Dorothy, we will also share the link of uh, once it's put on the YouTube, um, so that it's available for you and your followers too. And uh, I mean, I've been following you on Twitter for a long time and, and I, it's always been a pleasure. So in any case, anybody wants to uh, connect with her, uh, she is fairly active on Twitter. She has her ebooks out there. Uh, there she has put up her uh, connects, uh, feel free. I mean, Dorothy and I got connected from our team actually on Twitter. So don't say that networks don't work, both online and offline networks. It's just about being there, putting yourself out there and asking for help. Thank you so much, Dorothy. For no, thank you. And thank you everyone for, for being here. And um, I hope what I said was uh, helpful. So thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Dorothy. Thank you so much. And have a great thank day you. ahead and look forward to being in touch. Thank you so thank much. Thank you so much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. And this is Sarika here from Beyond Diversity. Both Nancy and I say goodbye to everyone. Have a great, great week ahead. And keep writing to us how you applied all these insights, both Dorothy and us. We would look forward to hearing your learning as well as share it with the others. 
uh, look forward to having you in our consecutive webinars. We do these webinars monthly. Feel free to join in and ask your friends to join in as well. Thank you. Thank you and goodbye everyone. Goodbye.